Have you ever considered how different the modern world would be without the legacy of the Roman Empire? For those of us in the West, the languages we speak, the contents of our letters, and the laws and faiths we obey can all trace their origins back to a bunch of angry warmongers who enjoyed poetry and blood sport. So, not much has changed really. Well, Taldor is to Avestan what the Roman Empire was to the West. It is called the First Empire, and while that's about as accurate as a wizard with a greatsword, it was the first empire to rapidly expand in Avestan, their armies scooping up their neighbours left and right. By the time of their golden age, Taldor not only ruled over most of Avestan, but their culture and traditions reached far beyond their borders and served as the basis for most modern nations, evidenced by things like the common language of the inner sea being called Taldian. It's said that the true test of a civilization's metal is time, and for this 6,000 year old empire, it has taken its toll. What used to be a nation that spanned from the Arcadian Ocean to Kazmaron, where Aradin himself was known to walk among his followers in a city covered in gold, is now a stunted remnant of its former glory, having lost control of all of its adopted territories and buried itself in bureaucracy and decadence. Nowadays, it's mostly ignored by its peers, like that one uncle who got drunk at the weddings and the funerals. But how exactly did this happen is not an easy question to answer since the history book that is Taldor is missing a few pages. Not surprising for something that's six millennia old. It's generally accepted that in the earliest years of the Age of Anguish, when humans were just starting to get back on their feet after Earthfall, the descendants of the Islanti refugees were pushed eastward by orcs and the native Kelid tribes. Eventually they settled near the Durin Forest and formed the city-states of Kazima, Opara and Zimar. A few centuries of infighting later, the Grand Prince Taldarus of Opara began a 12-year campaign to unite the scattered communities under a single banner. Using a combination of superior forces and tactical prowess, he forged a true kingdom. Taldarus reigned for 137 years because I guess when you're that tough, death waits till you're good and ready. By the time of his death, Taldor had become a single people, their many cultures having melded together to form something new. They stood united against the barbarity of an untamed world. During the Age of Enthronement, Taldor formed the first of its now legendary armies of exploration, composed of thousands of soldiers, scholars, diplomats, surveyors, spies and adventurers. The armies of exploration were instrumental to the expansion of the nation. There were six great armies in total, which led them to annex the territory now known as Galt, Andoran, Isgur, Malthun, Cheliax, Neomathus, Lastwall and Brevoy. Some people have made claims that there were two more armies as well that were wrecked by massive storms and sentient monkeys, but uh, Taldor doesn't seem to want to talk about those ones for some reason. In general, the armies of exploration fulfilled their mission of expanding the empire. The problem is they went too far too fast. Taldor's dominance over the inner sea region and most of southern Avestan swelled its government to an enormous size eventually spreading itself so thin that corruption and vile excess plagued its outer prefectures, later spreading to every level of its government. This turned out to be rather convenient for Taldor's neighbour and old enemy, Kadira, who had been waiting for a chance to expand. They attacked the heartland of Taldor, with the might of the Padisha Empire of Kelish behind them, and by choosing to counterattack, Taldor exposed itself to rebellion from within. When the Chaush governor Aspex the Eventongued declared independence, a mostly bloodless series of secessions took place, in which Taldor lost all of the territory that had been conquered by their armies of exploration. After 500 years of war, Taldor finally managed to repel Kadiran, retaining all of their original country, but the rest of the empire was gone and they were in no position to get it back. Quite a heavy price to pay, but hey, at least they still had their guard Eridan. What do you mean he died three years later? Oh god damn it. <sighs> Well, after all that, modern Taldor is no bigger than the deers of Taldaris. What seemed like quite the achievement then looks pretty lousy by today's standards. Taldor's landscape has been reduced to an expanse of druid protected woods and rolling grasslands in the north, the central regions, and the weed-choked scrublands in the south. Natural borders such as the Selwyn River and the World's Edge Mountains separate them from their ancient enemies and old territories. While Taldor has very few natural waterways to connect the interior with the coast, early in Taldor's history, their civil engineers excavated canals that gave Taldor's citizens easy routes of travel across the Empire's heartland, creating a network of waterborne trade and becoming the lifeblood of Taldor's economy. 
Since the war with Kadira, the canals have fell into disrepair. Only a few key lines near the capital city of Opara are maintained, and the rest have either dried up, turned into marshland, or fallen under the control of brigands. On the plus side, after 6,000 years of civilization, most of Taldor's monster population has been culled, although many places still have their share of dangers. This has forced monsters to adapt, with those that can hide amongst humans excelling in this civilized land. The biggest thing you have to worry about in Taldor is a different kind of monster, your fellow man. From brigands and canal pirates to gangs and assassins, life in Taldor can be very short indeed for those who mix with the wrong crowds or fail to peer the appropriate bribes. Modern Taldan society is short-sighted, hedonistic and uses words like avant-garde despite having no clue what it means. Its thousands of noble houses fight over positions in the various departments of the nation's bloated bureaucracy. Greed and distrust characterise Taldan politics, and betrayal and assassination are the preferred methods for the aristocracy to increase their station. Even Taldor's monarch is not immune to this. Unable to trust any of the feuding factions of Opara, the prince protects himself from the treachery of his subjects by employing Ulfen mercenaries as his personal bodyguards, since they have no stakes in the politics of his country. Currently, Crown Prince Stavian III is the Emperor of Taldor, but the awkward and bitter sovereign is as self-indulgent as his empire. He surrounds himself with grandiose titles and flatterers, spending his time dabbling in the Archean arts or whatever else can keep his attention. To be fair to the aging prince, he's probably just trying not to think about how his only son is dead, and his daughter Eutropia is pushing to remove the ancient laws that prevent women from inheriting his crown, so that she can claim it when he finally kicks the bucket, assuming she even waits that long. Or perhaps he's just scared that her progressive ideas might actually work. While the aristocracy sends representatives to the Senate to argue endlessly over trivial matters, responsibility for governing falls to the overworked government bureaucrats and a seemingly infinite amount of ceremony and red tape slows down the progress of most of their projects. Despite its many, many faults, the system does work, even if just barely. Government and life in Taldor is fairly consistent for the most part, even if the inner workings are frustratingly hard to grasp. The efficiency of Taldor's government varies massively depending on an area's direct ruler. The nation is divided into 12 prefectures, each with their own distinctive issues and ruled by a different Grand Duke. Those are then divided into duchies, which are then further divided into counties, which are then further divided into bar- <sighs> Eventually the question of who's in charge here comes down to a matter of metres, not miles. It's- it's not great. While many towns at least know relative comfort and safety, in others the people are taxed and worked to death so that their local baron or count can laugh and grow fat. What few authorities aren't corrupt do the best they can with mixed results. The divide of power and wealth in Taldor is extremely disproportionate. The aristocracy is only a small minority of the population, but predictably controls nearly all of the wealth and influence. The gap between the lowest noble and the most influential commoner is wider than in any other inner sea nation. While many scholars see this as a recipe for revolution, Taldor's government and society remain surprisingly stable thanks to large-scale civil engineering and social projects that ensure a relatively high standard of living for all of its citizens. Even the poorest farmer has access to clean water, well-built roads and green in times of famine. Another factor is national pride which further cements Taldor's stability. The nobility believe themselves to still rule over an empire at the height of its influence, while the lower classes believe themselves to be the backbone of a great nation. As delusional as that sounds, it does keep them going. The nation drowns itself in traditions, marking both their greatest strengths and their gravest failings. With every victory and innovation that Taldor claims, two overblown legends follow suit. Heritage and history are cornerstones of Taldan identity, and families of all social standing can trace their lineage back dozens of generations. For all their love of history, however, the Empire's people have surprisingly short memories, cherry-picking the most notable events and forgetting major military defeats and ridiculous royal decrees, including a period in which only nobles were permitted to have beards, or that time when they banned the worship Seren Ray, you know, the goddess of healing. I suppose if you're a peasant, you can always pay the Church of Abadar your life savings to have your broken arm fixed. There's a joke about healthcare in here somewhere. Taladin's nobles, on the other hand, are much better off. At least they don't have to do backbreaking labor. They do, however, face constant pressure to remain relevant amongst the aristocracy, be it achieving a new title, setting a new fashion trend, or throwing the year's most scandalous gala. 
Tell the nobles sometimes go to absurd lengths to appear wealthier and more influential than their peers. In most cases, the nobles have the money to fund these exploits, but even the oldest families might plunge themselves into debt in order to avoid feeding into obscurity. Commoners, on the other hand, generally lack this ambition and are more concerned with fulfilling their roles. A nation's backwards bureaucracy and wasteful galas mean little to farmers and merchants, who never see them anywhere, so they rarely understand why foreigners are so focused on these aspects of their nation, rather than on the healthy markets and sturdy roads or the unparalleled navy that keeps them safe and prosperous. Commoners recognise their own vital role in maintaining the complex machine that is Taldor, and take pride in that. Rich or poor, Taldans of all walks of life appreciate the arts, with many citizens learning to paint or play an instrument. This has given rise to myriad art galleries and bardic colleges across the countryside, and those in the major cities are some of the most respected in Avistan. While art might be Taldor's most famous export, its most common is actually diplomacy, which the nation produces in the form of bureaucrats, tutors and mediators all in high demand by the entire inner sea region. The youngest children of noble families, who have little hope of inheriting their parents' wealth or titles, often pursue these careers. For the rest of Taldor, the easiest way to obtain prestige and a shot at joining the aristocracy is a career in one of the four branches of the country's military. The Taldan Phalanx are the Empire's foot soldiers, who employ a strategic combination of archers and spearmen to conquer their enemies. And yes, Paizo did just take the name of the Roman tactic and use it as the name of their group that uses said tactic. Sometimes they're just so on the nose they punch you in the face. Anyway, the Taldan Horse is the Empire's mounted unit, including both cavalry and elephants, because that's a type of horse, obviously. There's also the Taldan Imperial Navy, which is based in the city of Casimir, which is all that stands against the strong fleets of Cheliax, Andoran, and Kadira. Because of this, they receive considerable funding and equipment to make sure that the shores of Taldor remain safe, with a subdivision called the River Guard assigned to protect the many canals from pirates using a small fleet of ships. But the most infamous of Taldor's warriors are the Lion Blades, specialists who come from the Empire's most secretive school of fighting arts. Lion Blades prefer crowded urban areas and are masters of motion, controlling both their own movement and those around them. Adept at espionage, camouflage and assassination, they are a powerful weapon to those with political ambition. The next thing we're going to cover is the Empire's capital, the Gilded City of Opara. The term Gilded is more fanfare than reality these days, with most of the gold plating on the architecture having been sold off to pay the country's debts. Golden sailings or not, Opara remains the beating heart of the Empire and the centre of Taldan culture. In other words, it contains a few fleeting reminders of their past glory to distract from the chasm that is the wage gap between rich and poor. You could try dropping a coin in there to see how deep it is, but one of the nobles will just catch it on the way down. Opara was built on the ruins of a settlement established long ago by the Islanti refugees. It has suffered quite a few setbacks over the centuries, including some fires, a few civil wars, and being almost completely levelled by the Tarask, otherwise known as start re-rolling your character. Now despite this, the city always manages to bounce back, rising from the ashes each time with vast civil improvements and some of the greatest works of engineering ever seen in Golarion, like the Lion's Gate and the Grand Bridge of the Empire. Public fountains and marble statues can be found at many major crossroads and plazas. Columned villas and grandiose temples from every age of Taldor's history line the streets and even the humble merchant districts are holdovers from better days. Most of Opara's buildings are made of carved stone and the roads are paved with either intricate mosaics or well-fitted cobblestones. Much of the city's advanced public works have withstood the test of time, including its enormous sewer system and the network of stone gutters that keep the streets clear of summer rain. The city also serves as the centre of Taldor's government, housing the Imperial Palace, the Senate and the Altar of Divine Innovation, a former temple to Aradin that now houses most of the government's day-to-day -day activities. Speaking of repurposing temples to Aradin, the city housed tons of them that were slowly converted into opera houses or tourist attractions. Only the Basilica of the Last Man still stands today for those who still worship the dead god. With its twin harbours, one on each side of the Grand Bridge, Opara remains the mercantile heart of the nation. People from all over Golarion come to trade in its vast markets, and the docks are often so crammed with ships that the river itself can't be seen. It houses all of the infrastructure needed to support these markets, including currency exchange, factories, import-export firms, open-air markets, shopping squares and warehouses. 
Between the docks, the infamous Greer Market deals mostly in dubiously acquired Kadiran goods, likely pillaged by Taldor's many unofficially sponsored pirate ships, which can be found skulking around in Kadiran waters. Opara also serves as fertile grounds for the arts. Here, the famous Catharidean Academy and Rhapsodic College train some of the most talented bards and Gularian, which are requested far and wide in foreign courts. However, the school's other purpose is to serve as the recruitment grounds for the Lion Blades, as the organization seeks out bards in particular due to their versatile skills and creative minds, scouting the most promising students for training in one of their many shadow schools hidden throughout Taldor, the greatest of which is beneath the academy itself, amongst other secrets. Although some districts house a number of thieves and cutthroats, most of Opara is well patrolled by the city constables. Citizens have little fear of major upheaval, trusting in the traditions of Taldor to protect them no matter how chaotic the political situation becomes. This trust, however, is perhaps their greatest downfall, as being surrounded on all sides by marvels of art and engineering only serves to embolden a sense of national pride, which blinds them to the reality of their situation, that they live in a hole. The ancient ruins underneath the city, however, are another story entirely. Dozens of ancient, interconnected dungeon complexes and vaults have been discovered over the course of Opara's long history, mostly under the district known as the Seven Towers. While the government has managed to seal all of the entrance to the ruins so far, rumours still persist of dangerous undead roaming around the district after dark, perhaps retreating to those mysterious ruins during the daylight. This is all starting to sound very familiar. Not only that, the ancient towers that give the district its name and seem to have been there since before the foundation of Opara sometimes hum unsettling low notes while the ground beneath appears to shift in waves. Thing is, as creepy and kinda cool as that is, the nation isn't really in a position to worry about the mysteries beneath its capital right now, as Taldor's influence continues to wane and everyone else just pretends they can't see them. The arrogant boasting of the Taldon seems to get quieter every day. Without Taldor, many of these nations would not exist, but like a grandfather dying alone in a nursing home, nobody cares. Taldor will likely meet its end, not with a bang, but a long whimper, one its citizens cannot hear. They'll be around for a while, centuries even, before there's nothing left, unless something is done to change that. And that concludes our look at Taldor. Be sure to check out the books in the description for our sources if you want to learn more, and leave a comment if you have any questions or something to add.